live streaming and they're going to let me know. Thank you. Welcome to Convocation today. We are so excited to welcome Dr. Joshua Lothringer to, uh, to Snow College campus. He is actually an assistant professor of physics at Utah Valley University, and he's been there since 2021. He got his BA in astronomy from the University of Colorado at Boulder, which is a lovely campus if you've ever been there, in 2013. And he worked there on the MAVEN mission to Mars and the Kepler Space Telescope. He got his PhD in planetary science at the University, University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory in 2019. And then he was a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University, home of the Space Telescope Science Institute. And so sorry for UVU, but he will be returning there as an assistant astronomer in 2024. He is the principal investigator of six Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope programs and a co-investigator on over a dozen more. Please welcome Dr. Joshua Lothringer to the convocation stage. Thank you, everybody. Well, it's great to be here. Um, it's a beautiful drive up from Orem this morning. Um, Um, so it's great to be here to tell you about some of the stuff we're doing with James Webb Space Telescope and how there's actually a connection to what was announced just now with the eclipse in October. Um, so I'll explain that. So that's why I call this eclipses across the galaxy, how we're connecting um, the eclipse in October to what we do out in space. Um, so let's get into it. So first off, I, I want to introduce JWST. You might have started seeing some beautiful images in the media um, some of those nebula, galaxies, maybe some exoplanet spectra. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about JWST because it, I think it's uh, kind of important. And then we'll talk about eclipses, both local eclipses, like uh, Utah's October annular eclipse, which I'll describe. Um, I'll mention the 2024 total solar eclipse because you should, if you want to go see that, uh, now's the time to make plans for that. Um, and then I'll describe how we relate that to exoplanets or planets outside the solar system. Okay, so first off, the story all starts with JWST. Um, JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, is NASA's kind of next big, next generation telescope. You might have heard about the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been taking beautiful images since before I was born. It was launched in 1990, and it's been at it ever since. JWST is much more new. Um, it launched in 2021 on Christmas Day. Uh, did anybody wake up super early to see it? Watched it like 4 a.m., 4 or 5 a.m. I woke up and watched it with my dad. It was, it was great. It was a, we always joke it's the best Christmas present any astronomer could, could wish for was for this thing to launch flawlessly. The thing was historically delayed and over budget, but the fact that it finally got up and off the ground was amazing, and it did it flawlessly. Uh, the European Space Agency launched it on an Ariane 5 rocket out of French Guiana in South America. It's close to the equator so they can get a boost from the Earth's orbital velocity. So it was chucked off the Earth, um, thrown out here, and this was the last image humanity would ever get of the James Webb Space Telescope itself. It would provide us with a whole bunch of great, beautiful images, but this is the last picture after the rocket kind of pushed the telescope uh, off and onto its traje trajectory out past the moon. So it's a little bit out past the moon at what we call a Lagrange point, where it's kind of just gravitationally stable, it just chills there for all of time. Um, and that's so it's that it's very isolated. One reason we want it to be very isolated is because we want it to be very cold. Obviously a telescope, you would go outside at night to use a telescope, so you want it to be dark. But James Webb Space Telescope, we really want it to be cold as well. Uh, the reason we want it to be cold is because it's an infrared telescope, uh, which I'll describe in a bit. But heat is a form of infrared light, and so if your telescope's warm, it'll give off a whole bunch of infrared light, and if you're trying to look at that infrared light on a galaxy across the universe, it's going to be a little difficult. Um, so JBST has this kind of funky design because of this stipulation. It's an entirely exposed telescope. Unlike the telescope you might have at home or any pair of binoculars or something, the mirror is entirely exposed to the vacuum of space, which is a little scary. 
It can get pe uh, pecked by uh, micrometeoroids, but it's overall okay. It's got that big gold mirror, um, 6, 6.4 meters. I think I have a slide on that later. Uh, it's a gigantic mirror, the biggest telescope we've ever put in space. Um, the light comes in, hits this gold mirror, hits this secondary mirror, and then gets funneled back into this kind of central portion. But we want that all to be shielded from the sun. So there's this kind of funky, kind of mylar balloon looking sun shield. And that's so that it's isolated, both blocks the sun, but also the heat. So on the sun side, or the observing side, the mirror is cooled down to 300, negative 390 degrees Fahrenheit. While the sun side is just facing the sun, and so it can reach temperatures of over 122 Fahrenheit, which is quite a bit. That's not even enough. For the mid-infrared instrument, there's a specific instrument on the telescope uh, that has a cryo cooler to cool it even further to negative uh, 449 degrees Fahrenheit. So the thing's super cold. Like I said, uh, the JWST's uh, mirror is 6.4 meters, gold-coated, because gold is really good at reflecting infrared light. Again, this whole thing's optimized for the infrared. Um, well, you might be used to Hubble's um, 2.4 meter aluminum coated mirror. Just like the mirror you have in your bathroom, uh, it reflects visible light really well. But JWST's is a little bit different, it's gold coated. A cool fact about JWST's mirror is that the substrate of the mirror, the actual structure of the mirror is made of beryllium. And that beryllium is very strong at these very cold temperatures. But that beryllium was actually mined here in Utah, uh, just to the north, west of here, I think, um, so that there's a piece of JBC that kind of came from the state of Utah, which is cool to think about. Okay, JBC has four instruments. Um, I'll talk about data that comes from some of these. Um, they all do different things. They look at different parts of the spectrum of different colors. Some take pictures, some take spectra or get rainbows of light. All of that is kind of centered at the back of the telescope. And so, like I said, you might have seen some of these images in the media um, starting, you know, it took maybe half a year for them to turn everything on, for the telescope to cool down to the appropriate temperatures, for them to focus everything uh, very exactly. It took about half a year. So last summer, two summers ago, summer 2021, um, we got the first images from JWST. Um, and this is one of, this is maybe my favorite. This is a star-forming region uh, in the Carina Nebula. So this is a bunch of gas and dust, a bunch of hydrogen, helium, some dust and ice that's in the process of forming the next generation of stars and planets. Uh, I just think it's beautiful, right? Uh, it's kind of, I don't know, ethereal veil. Comparing that to Hubble, though, you can kind of see the improvement that we've, we've gotten. Um, JBC on the top versus Hubble on the bottom. Like I said, Hubble is visible wavelength, so it's what your eye sees. Um, but that can be clouded by things like um, all of that dust. So it looks pretty opaque. Um, so you can't really see through any of that gas and dust here. But with JBST in the infrared light, you can start to peer through that veil of gas and dust, and you can see all the stars, that, those newly formed stars that are hidden underneath the nebula um, there in the Carina Nebula. Okay, infrared light. I've mentioned infrared a few times. What exactly is infrared light here? So if you think of the electromagnetic spectrum, so this is all of the colors of light. If you take a prism and you split, spread out uh, the wavelengths of light, um, you get a rainbow, right? But that's just the colors that our eye can see. Um, we see a very narrow sliver of the actual full spectrum of light that's out there. If you go a little bit bluer than our eye can see, that's ultraviolet light. That's what gives you sunburns. Go even further, that's x-rays that can peer through your skin and look at your bones, and gamma rays, which are produced in giant supernova explosions. But if you go redder than our eye can see, so we call those longer wavelengths, you end up um, getting to the wavelengths associated with heat and um, all this gas and dust. That's the stuff that JBST is really good at looking at. As you can see, Hubble, like I said, was designed for visible light. So it kind of sees this middle chunk of wavelengths that our eye is really good at seeing. But JWST is different. 
In some sense, JVC is the successor to Hubble, but to a large degree, it's an entirely new thing because we're opening up this big part of wavelength uh, that we've never been able to look at the universe with before. So this is really a new lens to look at the, the, the universe. There have been some infrared telescopes before, like the Spitzer Space Telescope, but it was tiny. It was like 0 0.6 meters uh, large. JBST is 10 times larger than that, at 6.4 meters. Um, so JBST really an order of magnitude, literally better than anything we've had before. Here's a comparison to some of those past, um, past telescopes. Um, there's Spitzer, that's kind of the, the flagship. Um, infrared telescope that we had before. Um, there's also an even smaller one called WISE, the Wide, uh, wide Angle Infrared Survey Explorer or something like that. It's discovered a whole bunch of brown dwarfs and a whole bunch of asteroids and stuff. Uh, but it was even smaller. And you can see the improvement that we've gotten from WISE to Spitzer to now JBST. There's a whole bunch, a whole you know, cloud of gas and dust that we never knew was there uh, until we got this new telescope. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so one question I often get um, that I'll go ahead and answer is um, how do we actually take images of the universe? How do we visualize them? Because it's a little confusing. If this is light that's redder than our eye can see, how are we actually making uh, uh, images out of it? And so it's a lot like a color TV where you can get um, what you're your TV is actually doing, or your phone, anything with all those pixels. There's actually part of the pixel that's emitting red light, part that's emitting blue, and some that's emitting uh, green, RGB. Um, and those combined can make up any color of light. So each pixel is giving off some color. That's gonna be a combination of those three separate independent colors. In astronomy, we do the same thing. We take a picture uh, that would be in a uh, kind of make up the red colors, a picture that would make up the blue, and a picture that would make up the green. And then you can vary those, you can lay those on top of each other, and you can get the nice color images. And so in some sense, they're false color and that our eye can't see in the infrared. That's the whole definition of the infrared is it's too red for our eye to see. But we can actually um, kind of visualize it for ourselves. Like if our eye could see in the infrared, this is what it would see. And so this, is, this was the first kind of color image that came out. This is what they presented, NASA presented to President Biden. There was a whole town hall um, event, which was really exciting. Um, and this was a, a beautiful image. It's a deep field. So basically, they found a very dark piece of the sky, and they just stared at it. This was maybe eight hours of exposure time. So imagine taking a camera, almost like a time lapse, and just stare at the same place for eight hours and collect all of that light. This is what you would see if you had the 6.4 meter uh, mirror of JWST. Um, and again, this is all infrared light, but you can see on the bottom here all the filters that were used to piece together what this um, image actually looks like to uh, our, our eye. What they're looking at here is a whole bunch of galaxies. Almost every single smudge, except for the really bright things, these are stars, that's a star, that's a star, that's a star. Almost every other smudge of light in this image is an individual galaxy made up of probably millions, probably billions of individual stars. Uh, so this is what we call a galaxy cluster. There's a big honking galaxy in the middle there and a whole bunch of small satellite galaxies surrounding it. Um, so this is one of those images that's almost incomprehensible to think about how vast the universe is and how many stars you're looking at. Just think of how many planets and civilizations might be in this one image. It's kind of fun to think about. Okay. One question you might ask also is why the infrared? Sure, you can peer through some of that gas and dust, but why the infrared? Don't you want to get something that our eye could see maybe? I remember when I first heard about JBST, I was a, an undergraduate, and I was kind of disappointed. I was like, I, I want something that's like Hubble, but better, right? Um, but hopefully I can convince you that JBC is indeed better than Hubble. Um, first of all, to look through all that gas and dust, that's really important. But one of the main reasons JWST was built was to look at all of those distant galaxies, all these types of galaxies, and even further. One key point 
is that the universe we now know since the 1930s is expanding. So the universe is getting bigger. The, the distance between galaxies is increasing. Um, because that's happening, the galaxies, on average, are all moving away from us. That means that their light is going to be Doppler shifted. So just like an ambulance as it drives past you will go from high pitched to low pitched, the light from these galaxies that's moving away from us will go from high frequency to low frequency or short wavelength to long wavelength. What that means is that the light from these galaxies is getting redder. They're getting so red that the galaxies on the edge of the universe uh, that were looking back in time, you know, billions of years, those galaxies are moving so fast that the light has been redshifted all the way into the infrared. And so to be able to see galaxies on the other side of the universe, we have to look at the infrared. We really have no other choice. So we're looking at redshifted light from distant galaxies. Another key point is that the light that came from, from these galaxies is billions and billions of years old. It, light has a finite speed. It's not instantaneous, kind of feels like it. Um, but light has a finite speed, something like, what, 300,000 meters per second? Um, very, very quick. Um, but that means that it takes time for light to propagate across the universe. And so when we look back and we see these really distant galaxies, what we're really doing is looking back in time. And that's why JBST was built, is we want to figure out how these galaxies were formed, what was happening at the very beginning of the universe to try and get clues on how all this uh, began. But to look at these galaxies that are 13 billion light years away from 13 billion years ago, we have to look in the infrared. And so we get, we get plenty of beautiful images from JVST. But this is only going to make up about a third of what the telescope's actually doing. Most of the time, the telescope is going to take that light make it hit a prism, or what we call a grism, a grading prism, some, something that will spread that light out so we can look at the rainbow of colors that make up those galaxies. So you can look at a, a galaxy like this, take in the light, it'll hit some grading, and it will get spread out into the rainbow of colors. You can then record those colors and see how bright is it at different wavelengths, and how bright is it in the blue wavelengths, or red. And this is really useful because different elements in the atmosphere of an exoplanet or in a galaxy that's on the other side of the universe are going to emit um, different wavelengths of light depending on what they're made of. So for example, hydrogen or oxygen or carbon are all going to emit specific colors. And so you can look at the, what the colors the galaxy is emitting to figure out what it's made of. That's pretty cool. You can look 13 billion years ago and see what a galaxy, what the atoms and molecules that are in that galaxy are made of. That's really powerful for trying to figure out this whole story of how the universe has evolved since the beginning of time. Okay. And so I'm going to talk a lot about um, spectra, which is basically just let's record all of that, those colors and see what's there, primarily to figure out what something's made of. You can also use this to help measure temperatures of things. So you can measure the temperature of a galaxy on the other side of the universe, which again is kind of cool. Okay. But now I want to mention a few things about exoplanets. Let me take a drink real quick. So I do exoplanets. Um, I don't deal with any of those galaxies. Um, I think they're cool, but that's not what I do. Um, so what is an exoplanet, first of all? An exoplanet is simply a planet around another star. You're probably familiar with the solar system planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. You can include Pluto if you want. Um, those you could maybe classify as endoplanets, so planets within the solar system. They're all orbiting the sun. But there are plenty of stars out there, and so there's plenty of planets orbiting those various stars. The trouble is that they're really small, they're really far away, they're really dim. And so for the longest time, we, we hypothesized their existence, but we didn't know they actually uh, were around. So when I was born in 1991, we didn't know of any planets, any exoplanets. 
The only planets we knew of were the eight or nine planets in our solar system. But since 1995, when the first exoplanet was found, we found a whole bunch. So over 5,500 planets have been found. Um, which is useful, right? If you only had eight planets and you tried to figure out what all the various types of planets there could ever be were, you would be missing out. With 5,000 planets, you can, you can figure out how these planets work in a lot more detail. Uh, and it's really opened our eyes to how uh, lucky we are to have a, the beautiful Earth that we have, um, and also how unique our solar system is as well. Okay. Okay. So uh, I mentioned here, most of these planets, most of these 5,500 planets, have been found through something called the transit method. So again, these planets are small, they're dim, they're hard to see. So we have to come up with indirect methods, usually, to find these exoplanets. And one of them is what we call a transit. So if the geometry is just right and the planet's orbiting just right, that it crosses the surface of the sun uh, from our line of sight, like in this image, where the planet passes in front of the star, between us and the star, um, then the light from the star will temporarily get blocked. And so the star will appear dimmer for a little bit. Generally, these, these transits happen on the order of hours. So if you see a planet transit across its host star, um, the star will be bright for a while, and then over the course of like an hour or a few hours, that, that star's brightness will dip. And so all you have to do is you have to look at stars and see ones that kind of have these dips and brightnesses to infer the pr presence of these exoplanets. And that's been done with various telescopes, um, and so far we've found thousands of planets with this method. But basically what we're doing is we're watching eclipses from light years away, which is kind of cool. And that's the connection to Utah's eclipse, right? Is eclipses happen whenever you have one object kind of move in front of another. And in space, they're relatively rare because these distances are so huge. But when you get the geometric alignment just right, you can, you can see these eclipses. Here's an example of an eclipse within our own solar system. This is uh, the sun, right? See those sunspots? And the planet passing in front here up there is Venus. I think this was in like 2012, uh, was the last time Venus transited the sun. I think the next time is in uh, many decades. Um, but this is kind of a unique, a, a unique view, Venus eclipsing or transiting across the sun. So if you were an alien civilization kind of behind us and you saw the brightness of our sun dip, you could infer the presence of a planet like Venus, which is kind of cool. But essentially, like I said, these are all just eclipses. Here on Earth, we're familiar with a couple types of eclipses that I, I want to define. There are solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, and sometimes uh, they're easy to get switched up because they all involve the sun and they all involve the moon to some degree. Um, a solar eclipse is when the sun gets blocked out by the moon from our vantage point. So he, us here on Earth, we look up at the sun and if the moon moves in front of the sun, that's where we get a solar eclipse. Lunar eclipse is kind of the opposite where the moon is on the far side of the Earth over here and it's the Earth that does the blocking. So the light from the sun gets blocked by the Earth, and so the moon, which would otherwise be nice, bright, and full, actually goes dim for a little bit as the Earth kind of moves inside, uh, moves in the way. In some sense, the, the moon is in Earth's shadow at this point. Or alternatively, in the solar eclipse, um, we are in the moon shadow. Because the moon's so small, though, Solar eclipses only happen uh, on a portion of the Earth at any given time, whenever they, they happen. Um, so they're relatively rare in that sense. Well, lunar eclipses, the whole moon's gonna get, get eclipsed. Um, so if you're anywhere on the night side hemisphere of the Earth, you can see these lunar eclipses. And these happen maybe a couple times a year. But there are different types of solar eclipses, right? It's truly a cosmic coincidence that the moon is just big enough to block out the sun. There's no reason that should be the case, um, and there's plenty of moons in the solar system that never totally uh, block out the sun's light from their planet's vantage point. But we're lucky here on Earth that the angular size, when you look up in the night sky or the day sky, that the size of the sun and the size of the moon are very similar. And so when the alignment is just right and the moon totally blocks out 
uh, the sun's light. We call that a total solar eclipse. These are the most dramatic. Uh, you know, day turns to night for a few minutes. Um, I didn't actually get to go to the, the one that happened several years ago, but some of you might have. Um, anybody go to that one, 2017? Yeah, some of you. How was it? Was it cool? Yeah. It's supposed to be like super eerie, like the birds start chirping weird, you know. Um, probably animals go a little bit crazy because they, they don't know this is gonna happen. Um, so it's a cool experience, and I encourage you to go to the next one, which I'll describe. But sometimes this alignment isn't quite right. Sometimes the geometry, you're off just a little bit, and the moon only blocks a portion of the sun. So we call a partial solar eclipse. And sometimes it's the case that um, either we're too close to the sun, our, our orbit around the sun's slightly elliptical. So we, we go closer to the sun and further away in our orbit just a little bit. And same with the moon around the Earth. Sometimes the moon is a little bit closer, so we call supermoons. Um, sometimes the moon's a little bit further away. When it's a little bit further away, the angular size of the moon is just too small to completely block out the sun. Um, but if you still get it transiting the full disk of the sun, um, you can get an annular eclipse where the moon blocks out the sun, but the sun's just a little bit too big, and so you get this ring of fire. That's what they call it, ring of fire. And so annular eclipse is what we'll get here in Utah on October 14th. Um, really lucky here in um, southern Utah here. Uh, this is the path of total annular, I guess the path of annularity. Um, so this is where you'll be able to see the full moon go across the sun, but there'll still be a ring of fire. Um, here's gonna last like 30 seconds, so that's why they're doing your guys' event down in Richfield. If you go a little bit south, it'll last a little bit longer, so it'll last a few minutes. Um, so I encourage you to, to go down to, to Richfield, right? Um, and, and see this annular eclipse. Again, you do need glasses, so that's why they offer them there. Um, because some of the sun is still exposed, you don't want to just stare directly at it. Um, so get eclipse glasses, you can get them online, you can get them at the event. Those are really important. But you can see it another way. Um, if you see shadows, um, the shadows, you know, the, the sun's, the full disk of the sun's no longer making your shadows. Um, it's only this partial crescent of the sun that'll be making uh, the shadows. And so if you, you know, get a pinhole camera, get, get a piece of paper, put a hole in it, you can see the, the kind of image of the sun that's created, or um, look at a tree and the, the shadows of the, all the leaves, and you'll get this kind of weird effect um, that the, you kind of see these mini images of the sun as the eclipse is happening. So pay attention to that too. Um, this will happen during the partial uh, eclipse phase. So this will happen for a few hours that you'll go outside and you'll see weird shadows. It's kind of a weird experience. Um, but again, yeah, so this is a solar eclipse, not a lunar eclipse. The sun's getting blocked out by the moon, and it's an annular eclipse. So you'll still get that ring of fire. Um, here's another kind of demonstration of what's happening here. During a, a, a let's do, total eclipse, um, the moon fully blocks out the sun. Annular eclipse, um, we kind of miss the fullness of, of, of the shadow of the moon. Um, and so the moon's a little bit too small. And partial is where you're in only the partial shadow of the moon. So if you were um, up in Salt Lake, you would see the partial eclipse. Um, because you were, we, we'll see the moon hit the sun, but it won't fully, the alignment just isn't quite right. Okay, but like I said, the total solar eclipse is the exciting part, most exciting part. I definitely encourage you to check out the annular eclipse. But total solar eclipse, that's what you know, people say, oh, it's life changing. It's, um, something you should definitely experience before you die. Um, and luckily, there's one coming up next year. Um, so April 8th, 2024, there'll be a, a total solar eclipse going from uh, northern, New Mex or northern Mexico um, through kind of the Midwest and up through like Maine there. So if you have any friends in, let's see, Dallas, uh, Cleveland, St. Louis is close, but not quite. Uh, Buffalo, New York, Montreal is pretty close, uh, northern Maine. Um, that's along that path of totality. Just about everywhere else in the United States, you'll see a partial eclipse where you're just a little bit off from the, the alignment. 
But along this thin line here, that's the path of the total solar eclipse. So that's where you'll actually see the full disk of the moon block out the sun. Um, you should look, but probably hotels are really expensive along this line. Um, they start like selling out of rooms like years in advance. But it's worth checking out, especially you know if you know people there. Um, I'm gonna crash on a friend's couch in uh, Akron, Ohio, and, and watch it. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check it out in April, April 8th. It's a Monday, I think. Ask your professors for, for time off. Maybe. Okay, but like I said, this is exactly what we're doing with planets. Basically, every time an exoplanet transits its host star, we're watching what would be called an annular eclipse. The planets are too small to fully block out the, the star, obviously, but we can at least get um, an annular eclipse as these planets transit, measuring this dip in light. So that's what we did. Um, I was part of a team, um, it's called the Early Release Science Program, where we really wanted to understand how the telescope was working. Um, you know, this data is really complex to deal with. Um, it's got a whole bunch of kind of quirks. Um, it has a bunch of systematic noise and everything. And we want to figure out what exactly can we do with this brand new telescope. And so they made data from this telescope for the first like month or so completely open access, that as soon as the data hit the ground, it was public. And indeed, all Hubble, um, James Webb, all NASA data becomes public at some point, usually at least within a year or so of the data being taken. So you can go mess with these raw images and stuff and, and play with some of the spectra if you're interested. But this is what one of the transits that we looked at um, looked like. And indeed, the, the star is bright, and then it gets eclipsed for a little bit. We see this annular eclipse. This was of a hot Jupiter we call WASP-39b. Uh, they all have weird names because they're kind of named after either the star they're around or the survey that found them. WASP stands for the Wide Angle Search for Planets. This was the 39th planet uh, found with the WASP survey, so it's WASP-39b. But it's this big Jovian, big Jupiter-sized object that's actually super close to its host star, so it's actually something like 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so kind of unusual. Um, and so we want to figure out what's going on in its atmosphere. Which kind of begs the question, how do we actually figure out what's going on in these planets' atmosphere? Sure, you can detect the planet as it passes in front of its host star, but what can you tell about the atmosphere? Because that's what I do, is the, specifically trying to figure out what are these atmospheres made of. The key idea is just that, um, yeah, the key idea here is that the, the depth of this transit, how much light gets blocked here, depends on the size of the planet. It turns out that the size of a planet is actually not uniform for all colors. It depends, if you have an atmosphere that blocks a lot of light, um, the planet will look a little bit bigger. But at colors where maybe there's gases in the atmosphere that don't absorb, then the planet will actually look a little bit smaller. So what this chart is trying to demonstrate is that the depth of that transit curve will depend on wavelength. Another way you can think about this is that there are elements and molecules in the atmosphere of the planet, and so as the light from the star gets filtered through the atmosphere, some of the light gets blocked and some of it doesn't. So for example, this big yellow um, color here, if there's sodium there, it'll get blocked and the planet will look bigger at those wavelengths. Sodium, or, uh, potassium, K on the periodic table, absorbs really well at these red wavelengths. And so if, the, um, if there's light from the star at those wavelengths, it's gonna get blocked. The planet's gonna look bigger. Your transit depth is larger. And so you can infer the existence of these different molecules and atoms. And so here's an example of what one of these spectra we think looks like. This is just a model, a simulation of the atmosphere. And so again, this is the transit depth um, or the level of absorption, so how, how deep that transit light curve is. The main point is that it's not constant with wavelength, there's all these bumps and wiggles, and all those bumps and wiggles are telling you what the planet's atmosphere is made of. The plot from before was, was this zooming in at optical wavelengths, looking at sodium and potassium, but JWST is looking in the infrared, and there we get a whole bunch of information about what's happening with molecules like water, methane, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Okay. 
And Hubble, Hubble was great, it was wonderful, but it was optimized not for the infrared, only for optical wavelengths. So it could get a little bit of water here, maybe the sodium and potassium, but that was it. JWST, like I said, is an infrared telescope. It's opening up this whole new regime for us to look at these atmospheres with. Now we can find molecules that we never knew uh, were actually gonna be in these planets. Um, so again, like I said, this is part of the early release science program where we were looking at a few different planets to try and figure out um, how the telescope worked while also trying to figure something out about the planets. Um, this was on the cover of uh, the science magazine Nature. Um, when we finally released all these papers, there was a flurry of five different articles all about um, the spectrum that I'm about to show you. Um, if you don't believe me, you don't take my word for it, uh, there's my name, I'm part of this. There's, this is a giant collaboration of 100 different people, uh, and I played a very small role in part of this, um, but this is what I spent the summer of 2021 doing, which was oh, 2022, uh, which was a lot of fun. What we ended up with was a whole bunch of data, all of these spectra, all these bumps and wiggles. We used all of JBC's instruments to figure out what was going on, uh, and we found in total, sodium, potassium, water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and the big surprise was sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is, um, I'm trying to remember what it smells like. It's, it's not the rotten egg one, it smells like something else. If you ever go to Hawaii uh, and you go to like the volcanoes, you often need to wear a gas mask in part because of SO2, sulfur dioxide. Um, but this was unexpected. This was a new discovery that we would never have had uh, unless we got these spectra with JWST. And this is what that, the spectra kind of all added up looked like. We got CO2, CO, water, all these beautiful molecules. And we've been doing that with a whole bunch of planets since. It's HAP P18b, WASP 18b, HD 189733b. Um, and this one, I forget the name of. They all have weird catalog names. Um, but we've, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're a year and a half into this telescope. We're starting to find all these new molecules. And the next step is to figure out what all this means. Where are they coming from? How did these planets form to get so much carbon or oxygen or maybe potassium and sodium? Um, and so that's what we're doing with this, this telescope. And hopefully you'll hear more about it in the future. Um, you'll probably see plenty more beautiful exo or, uh, ga galaxy spectra. Um, but for every galaxy spectrum that's out there, there's uh, you know, a bunch of exoplanet images and spectra as well. Okay, so I'm just about out of time, I think. Um, I would just take questions for, for a little while. Just in summary, JBC is NASA's new $10 billion infrared space observatory. Um, it's working just about flawlessly, and it's gonna answer a whole bunch of cosmological and exoplanetary mysteries. It's gonna open up a whole bunch too, which is exciting. Um, and I, at least, have been using, one of the uses for this telescope is to observe these eclipses light years away to understand exoplanet atmospheres. And don't forget the connection to what you'll see here in Utah, Saturday, October 14th, go down to Richfield, uh, and you can see this annular eclipse, basically uh, an endoplanetary version of what we see uh, in exoplanets. So I'll stop there. How about you take any questions you've got? We do have time for some questions, so please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Or I always have the list of students I can ask. Yes. What are some of your favorite theories about black holes? Favorite theories about black holes? Um, I don't know about theories. What I can tell you maybe what, well, I don't know. One thing that, that JBC is revealing about black holes, how would I, I, I word it like that. I don't do black holes like personally, so I'm not an expert. Um, so I, I enjoy them just as much as you do probably. But one thing that JBC is finding that's really interesting is these early galaxies, there's a couple mysteries about them. One is they're a little bit bigger than we think they would have been otherwise. Um, so these really, you know, things that are maybe 100 million years, couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, which is relatively short, astronomically speaking, they're 
big for what we would expect. Um, and one of the things that makes them big, and one of the, their features that's big, is um, the supermassive black hole at the center of a lot of these galaxies. We think just about all galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center. They play an important role for uh, making the galaxy, um, helping the galaxy evolve. And these really early galaxies seem to have really big, kind of almost anomalously big supermassive black holes. There's a big mystery um, that we'll hopefully solve in the next few years with JVST to figure out how do you build these black holes so big enough. And one idea is maybe you have a lot more galaxy collisions um, that are both building up the galaxy to be bigger, but also collisions amongst the supermassive black holes, which would be cool. You've maybe heard about gravitational waves. Those are like black holes that are formed from stars. So these are kind of puny black holes that collide. Um, but one day when we build even bigger interferometers, hopefully we can find the collisions of these supermassive black holes, which are like really big. That would be really cool. And by supermassive, I mean like millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. These are like incomprehensibly big. So, good question. All right, I just had a quick question about um, when you were explaining like how there's a solar eclipse and then a lunar eclipse. So what you explained the lo lunar eclipse being was what I always thought a new moon was. And so can you just explain what, what's kind of happening when a new moon is happening? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so um, normally when the, sun, when the moon is on this side of the sun, the, um, the sun is fully illuminating the near side of the moon. So normally in this configuration, the moon would be fully illuminated. Um, that's what we call a full moon. A new moon will happen when the moon um, has orbited in between us and the sun. So actually in this configuration, if you looked up and saw the moon, uh, you would see the dark side of the moon. Okay. Um, another way to think about it, because the, the moon's tightly locked, so it's always facing the same side as us, but it's just the amount of illumination of it that's giving us the different phases. So if the sun and the moon are in the same place, then we actually see the shadowed side of the moon. Makes sense. That's the new moon. If it's on the other side of us, then the, the sun is shining on the near side, just like it, the lights are shining on my hand. And so when I look up at the moon, it's fully illuminated. Okay. The thing about a lunar eclipse is that the moon is actually um, just aligned just right. Usually it's above or below the Earth, but when it's aligned just right, it's in our shadow. So it's actually the, the, the light that would normally be illuminating the full moon gets blocked. And so then it, it gets really dim and most, mostly the only light that, that reaches the moon is gonna be refracted light from our atmosphere and that will tend to be red. And so that's how you get these red blood moons um, during the lunar eclipse. Does that make sense? All righty, my question is how are we using the JWST to verify the direction of the universe's growth? How can we tell that it's younger in a certain direction? Yeah, yeah, so um, the key thing to think about there and the, the part where it starts to get a little mind bending um, is that like the expansion of the universe is happening equally in all directions. So there isn't necessarily like a young part over there that we're looking back in time and we're looking elsewhere. Um, it's really, the way I, I describe it is like the Big Bang happened everywhere. If you, if you run the clock backwards, the universe was smaller. And so the Big Bang happened kind of in a small point and everything has expanded since then. And there's nothing special about our position. It's just the fact that when we look at any galaxy, you know, all galaxies are moving away from one another. And so no matter where we look, um, all galaxies are moving away from us. What JVC is helping with though um, is a few different ways. One is to look at those early galaxies to see what they were doing early in time, like I was talking about with galaxy evolution. You know, there's a lot of questions on how do you build a galaxy like the Milky Way versus Andromeda or something. Um, the other thing JBC is gonna be really good at, um, or is at least gonna help with, is measuring the distances to these galaxies, which is kind of hard to do. Um, there's no meter stick in space to measure the distance to any galaxy. So you have to come up with these techniques for um, trying to figure out how far something is away. And JVC is gonna be really good at a few different of these techniques to measure the distances to galaxies 
which can then you can combine that with the information from the, the, the redshift and how fast it's moving. You combine those two pieces of information to tell how the expansion rate of the universe has remained the same, what it is, how has it changed over time. And right now there's a, uh, a tension between the expansion rate that we infer from the local universe and the expansion rate we infer when we look at the very beginning of the universe. And so there's something in our theories that um, needs to account for, for potentially what we call this Hubble tension, that the expansion rate might be a little bit different than what we, what we thought. And JBC is gonna be a big, big role in that. So, good question. Thank you. We're about out of time, so uh, let's thank again